Now, renowned banking consultant Dr. William Atulik has blamed the collapse of indigenous banks on failure of corporate governance structures. He says non-functioning loans and bad capital adequacy ratio are as a result of this, this problem. He observes most of the non-performing loans are advanced or unrelated parties. Dr. Atulik was speaking at the first in a series of practitioners forum on corporate governance and business ethics in Kumasi. Love Epham's Kwesi Debra report. UT, Capital and Unibank have recently suffered setbacks in a manner some refer to as collective national failure. Dr. Atulik admits the central bank has also failed in its bid to adequately manage its corporate governance. He challenged junior staff of banks to play monitoring roles and report infractions to appropriate quarters. The former board member of Tema Oil Refinery advocates establishment of risk committees which many businesses lack. He said this is essential for forecasting future problems and managing them properly. So most of them are having very bad capital adequacy ratios. Most of them are having non-performing loan portfolios. But uh, why did that happen? <laughs> governors. So it is because of corporate governors. The, the, the things that the board and the middle level and, and the senior management team and the middle level team. For most of the corporate banks, there were a lot of interviews, the junior staff, and uh, they didn't know what was going on. But most of those decisions are taken up at the middle, at the uh, senior to high level. So I will attribute a lot of these failures to uh, uh, board, board level and senior management level uh, in action or acting in a manner that rather and yours to their personal interest. Go into both of the banks and look, check the loan, the non-performing loans. They are mostly to related parties. And these are on the recommendation, some of the banks, there are some information that have not been made public, but we understand huge portfolio of those loans which are not paid back are given to people who are very close to very strong people at the top level. That's it. The Practitioners Forum is organized by the Institute of Distance Learning, Kwame Nkuma University fact, of Science it, it and Technology. The program is aimed at enriching. Sincere apologies for the technical hitches there. Now, moving on, other stories. Former Minister of Trade and Industry, Lee Lantif Vandapoy is requesting for some time frame for Parliament to study the recently signed African Continental Free Trade Agreement. According to him, the deal is an important document which will determine the future of trade among African nations, hence the need for better understanding by the citizenry before its ratification. Parliament has been recalled to ratify the agreement which was signed by 44 African countries last month in order to open up the African market for more intra-trade activities. These things, we don't get to do many more stakeholder discussions on this. Ghanaian businesses, Ghanaian trade traders, and things should have the opportunity to be consulted. And within this short time, I'm wondering what sort of uh, time they will have to submit memos and things to Parliament for Parliament to look at their side. Would we have enough consultation with traders, Guta, and these businesses to know what effects would this have on them? So that we, because what we should be doing should be in the interest of Ghanaians first. But I think that the time is too short for us to be able to do all these consultations adequately in order to have a much more informed document to put before Parliament. That is only my worry. So you think they should give you more time? I, 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 I think that if there is no deadline pertaining to the agreement, then we need to have more time. The committee must be given more time to consult with the Ghanaian businesses, Associate of Ghana Industries, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Guta, and all other stakeholders must have effective consultation so we can have a comprehensive and well looked at document that will not be to the disadvantage of any Ghanaian when it is finally ratified. 
The former deputy minister is also urging the Ghana, Ghanaian law enforcement agencies to ensure rigorous systems are deployed to check illicit trading and to avoid the country being used as a dumping ground for inferior goods. The fact that we have free trade doesn't mean that you can come and dump anything at all in the country. For example, Nigeria have what they call a list of 42. And a lot of countries have. Um, Japan, um, even America, the fact that they have free trade doesn't mean that you can just uh, uh, bump uh, into a container, toss it waste and come and dump it here. No, it's not, it's not. There are things that are, uh, in spite of the fact that we have a free trade, there are things that have certain level of restrictions that are not permitted, that are not allowed. And I said those things would definitely be looked at. And the, would our government ensure that those things are actually, I mean... You know, it's, it's a matter of system. It's, I mean, once you have a very effective and, let me say, disciplined system in order to police the regime, it, it, will not, it will not have any uh, serious implications for our trade and our business. What, is, what, what, what the danger is when you decide that you will not make your systems work and as, that, that fraud, the indiscipline, the corruption within the system possibly will fester the, the, the people who want to take advantage, undue advantage of the free trade regime. But then if you have your systems and your laws and your, uh, 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 let, me say, uh, let me say, the disciplinary measures and the regulations that will enhance the sustainability of the gains of the free trade, I don't think there is anything wrong with it. Now the IMF says Sub-Saharan Africa is seeing a modest pickup in economic growth from a rise of 2.8% in 2017 to 3.4% in 2018. Addressing a press conference in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. at the just-ended annual spring meeting, African Department Director Abebe Amiro Selassie says the growth is helped by external conditions, including stronger global growth, higher commodity prices, and favorable financing conditions. He also highlighted growing trade within Africa as a positive force, with intra-Africa trade growing from below 10% to almost 20% of the total region's trade. What Africa trades with each other tends to be more processed, more manufacturing type goods, exactly the kind of more diversified exports that our countries are seeking. So we think that, you know, uh, the, the CFTA, when fully implemented and when, uh, you know, if uh, coupled with uh, reforms to non-tariff barriers, facilitating infrastructure uh, to allow goods to move with each other, should, uh, should facilitate and encourage um, help allow connecting markets and you know deepen and uh, expand uh, the markets in which African firms uh, can trade so we strongly welcome it in terms of what's needed really to 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 support uh, the young people in the region really is uh, robust economies that are able to create the hundreds of thousands of jobs that each country needs every year uh, so I think it's with robust private sector uh, economic growth uh, that we will be able to find um, we will be able to uh, we will be able to uh, create jobs and opportunities for the young and uh, you know this circles back to some of the policies that we were talking about earlier uh, making sure that uh, there is an active process of identifying the constraints to to investment in areas removing distortions uh, addressing competitiveness issues where they arise where they arise sh really should not be underestimated in terms of how important they are to facilitate private investment and another side of the equation, of course, is for, for governments to, to provide uh, quality education uh, at all levels, um, to be able to have a workforce that is uh, ready for the jobs that are going to be created. This is on the marketplace. Let's now move on to one of our top stories. And the second deputy speaker of the Bank of Ghana, Elsie Awaji, has reiterated the central bank's resolve to review the Borrowers Amendment Act and to ensure that regulatory compliance in the banking sector are strictly adhered to. The Bank of Ghana has had to crack the whip on some industry players who have not complied with banking regulations. Madam Elsie Awaji, who has been speaking at the Bank of Ghana's stakeholders meeting in Accra, noted that good corporate governance practices are being employed to help reduce uh, the likelihood of bank failures. She also advocated a review of the Borrowers Amendment Act to bring more sanity in the system. CEO of the Chamber of Commerce and Industries, Mark Edouard-Bouadji, was at the Central Bank Stakeholder Engagement and has joined us with some thoughts on phone. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to the marketplace. 
Good afternoon, and let me say good afternoon to your very viewers. All right. Listeners as well. Now, one of the major challenges of the banking industry is the rising non-performing loans in the system. And uh, many, it has become so because many businesses fail to pay back, you know, uh, their monies on time. Now, you are representing, you know, businesses or the business chamber. Why is this the situation so? Why is it that you are calling for lowering interest rates and yet if the banks give you money, you find it difficult to pay back? Well, uh, the reason for the increase in non-performing loan may be many. And I don't think it is fair to blame the private sector for that. Let me give you a typical example. If um, a businessman uh, goes to the bank to go and execute a government project and the government, as of now, are not be able to pay back the businessman. It will be very difficult for the businessman to get the money to pay to the bank. And I, I, at the program itself, it was also agreed that uh, the banks should also improve on their credit risk assessment and performance. Okay. So it's a combination of things. Even the performance of the economy at any point in time can also contribute to the increase in non-performing loans. And if you look at three, four years back, uh, with the difficulty with the energy crisis and other things, a lot of businesses actually find it difficult to uh, even produce, let alone uh, make profit to be able to pay, pay back their loans. So these uh, issues have actually culminated towards this uh, high non-performing loan. Right. I want us to look at it holistically mm. and look at how collaboratively all stakeholders will come together to resolve this issue. All right, now the before we, before the rule of the central bank, the rule of the banks, and the rule of the private sector. Mm. And I think that this morning's program, for me, was very key. And okay. I think it's a, a step in the right direction towards resolving some of these issues. We acknowledge that um, majority of businesses uh, do borrow from the banks. I mean, yeah. with the, uh, uh, the soccer scene now picking up, most of the businesses, they send me the borrow from the banks. So anything that affects the banks, affect the private sector and affect the economy of Ghana. And I, I, I would say that the stability of the financial sector of the bank is very key. All right. So the private sector will not undermine or do anything that will affect the ability of the banks to operate efficiently and profitably. All right now, quite, quite apart from the fact that, you know, government sometimes delays in paying you what's uh, due you for you to also, you know, uh, pay back to, to, to the banks. Now, another key issue is the fact that you know uh, interest rates are high now the bank of ghana has introduced the reference rate system outside of the base rates now would this particular introduction help to check this condition uh, a bit well i think we have had a cause to complain about the high lending rate and the fact that the policy rate mm. is not being responsive in reducing the interest rate uh, the reference rate was introduced just about uh, I think a month or three weeks ago. And it's just a very short period to assess how it's going to reduce the interest rate. So we are monitoring. And we have, as a chamber, have set up a research team that are looking at the effectiveness of this reference rate. And I think that um, the Bank of Ghana, they also know what they are doing. So we're going to work together. If we feel that there are any contributions that we have to make towards bringing the interest rate down, then we will do that. So we are waiting patiently monitoring this reference rate and how it's going to reduce uh, the, the lending rate. Uh, for now, we have not seen any significant reduction in the lending rate now, and we don't expect that within these three weeks there will be that significant reduction. So it's important right. that we observe how this uh, reference rate will work. So currently, can, can you tell us how much government is owing you any of your members as of now? <laughs> It will be extremely difficult to come out with exact figure, but I know mm. substantial um, amount of our members are being owed by uh, uh, the government, by those in the construction sector. I mean, there have been attempts to pay some of them. Uh, mm. Some, they're also looking at how they can pay them. I know it will take some time, but we are actually urging government that they should try as much as possible uh, to pay these uh, 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 suppliers or contractors so that they'll be also be able to pay um, the banks. In fact, at the program, mm. the, the deputy governor mm. also acknowledged and also asked the banks to make provision for this um, uh, politically risk uh, loan mm -hmm. so that we don't get to a point where the banks would have advanced a lot of money into government-related projects that they are not able to get the money and it will affect them. So um, 
Uh, I think that we all have to work together to make sure that uh, the bank, the Bank of Ghana, is effective. The banks are working, the private sector is working, and the economy of Ghana is moving forward. Many thanks for your time. Mark Bedu Abwaje is the CEO of the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industries. Away from that, Ghana is set to be spending over $200 million on meat and meat products annually. This trend could, however, change if government increases investment into cattle production. Now, Fauzia to Adam reports the Kwesebe cattle ranch in the Volta region, which houses over 30,000 cattle, is demanding the establishment of a milk factory. Currently, milk produced at the ranch go bad because of lack of proper storage and processing facilities. The Kesava Cattle Ranch in the Norton constituency in the Volta region is home to over 30,000 cattle. The lush green plains guarantees the cattle enough grass for grazing even in the dry season. Here, caretakers are serious about vaccinating the animals to keep the animals healthy, free from disease outbreaks, and ultimately to rape from their investment. A cattle like this could go for as much as 1,200 Ghana cities. And right here, cattle rearing is a very big business. It's a very good business to rear animals. People from Ashama, Kofodia, then things. And at times, you catch it from here to Japan, for Turaku, to say. When the rainy season begins, the cattle get fresh grass to graze and enough water to drink. However, carting the cattle for sale is difficult because of the poor nature of the road. The challenge we are facing is how the road to the villages come a problem. Because if it is rain, car cannot come here. And then, if you want to sell an animal, you will suffer before moving to the town and sell. There's a main business, the milk, the things, people come for it. But during rainy season, car cannot come. The young headsmen are not paid with cash. They milk the cows and sell them for profit. <laughs> is the sound of a milking cow. I'm currently here at camp at the Norton constituency and they produce 75 liters of milk a day and a liter costs one CD. Sadly, during rainy season, the headsmen are unable to sell the milk also because of the poor nature of the road. After milking the cows and using some domestically, the rest go bad. Zachary is not happy with the current situation and wants a milk company established in the North Town constituency. Our main problem for here is say we don't get a milk company where we go supply the milk to. So in case, if we will get some any factory for here to help us, so that we produce the milk to them, they will buy the milk from us, they do business so that the boys around here will get business. Uh, I think it will help the community. Statistics from the Ministry of Agriculture shows that in 2014, Ghana spent $200 million on meat and meat products. Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that the expanding market for cow milk will be worth $400 million by 2019. But Ghana continues to untap this business potential. Government could partner the ranch and implement a milk factory under the one district, one factory program and provide jobs to the youth of North Tongue. Fauzia to Adam, Joy Business. And just before we go, the Dutch ambassador to Ghana, Ron Stricker, says the incidence of textile piracy in the country is carrying foreign investors and other industry players away. According to the ambassador for the Ghana Textiles Limited, which remains on the brink of collapse, can no longer compete with the influx of, of counterfeit materials from China and other neighboring African countries. We spoke to Joy Business at the sidelines of the Business Export Awards event here in Accra. All right, we sincerely apologize for our inability to play you that story. We will definitely bring to you uh, on Business Life later in the evening. And that's it for the market, please, this afternoon. Many thanks for watching. My name is Emmanuel Abwaji. We are here with the business.